human rights and I say a concentration in prison studies because I got to um, tailor my education to what I wanted it to be. Um, so a lot of the things within law, economics, and public policy have kind of um, tailored it to prison studies, kind of like history of mass incarceration, um, the economics behind like redlining and policies that really affected um, Black communities and communities that really now populate our prisons. Um, and then my junior year, spring quarter of junior year, I got to take a class that was a mixed enrollment class. So I got to go up to um, Monroe Corrections, which is one of our state prisons here. Um, and so I got to take a Are class. Are you in Louisiana? No, I'm in Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Got gotcha. you. All right. Um, so I got to take a class on the inside. Um, it was a mixed enrollment class. It was 12 of us and 12, the, 12 of them. Um, it was an arts class, but we really talked about social justice issues and stuff um, through the medium of the arts. So DOC won't really take a lot into it. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and so after three months of that, um, I signed up to be a volunteer um, and then worked my way up to become a sponsor. Um, and so I work with the um, Muslim population that's at Monroe Corrections, um, just because I we went up there every Friday, and um, Friday is when we do our uh, congregational prayer, and so I would see them all meet up. And there were a couple others who were Muslim in the class as well, and so it was just really interesting to see the dynamics and my, like, viewpoint kind of shifted once because it's once I got inside because it's different reading it on pen and paper versus you know being in there and going through security experiencing everything there with them and so um that really motivated me to kind of start um well what I'm working on now is kind of a, a re-entry program specifically for the Muslim brothers that are there because that's something that um I feel like our Muslim community doesn't really take seriously um, and hopefully be of benefit. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot. And, and it's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's crazy that that um that we are making this connection. You read my bio? Mm-hmm. All right. So uh my bio doesn't really give you everything. Um yeah, I I I, I am a, a re-entry advocate, self-proclaimed. Mm -hmm. So one of one of the things I I started doing upon my release was reaching back because there were uh you know so I I did seventeen years, but I had thirty years, um oh. which which will be revealed in my TED talk tomorrow actually, um is just how how um like one of the things I felt after leaving was guilt because mm -hmm. of the people I left behind. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the Muslim community inside, the, the, the congregational prayer, as you call it, they call it Juma. Every Friday, mm -hmm. Juma is the biggest prayer. So all the, all the, all the Sunni brothers gather and go to Juma every Friday. Um, yeah, I, I have, uh, I'm not Muslim, but I'm very familiar with the faith. Um, you know, having done so much time, I, I studied, you know, I studied uh, world religion. Um, so I know where they, you know, the, the um, vantage points, different vantage points, um, the different schisms that occurred in different religions. But my 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 passion is prisons, and mm -hmm. and my passion is reentry. Mm -hmm. um, I I recently I, I have a manual I just published and copy copy wrote a manual to help individuals returning to prison, returning to society. I would love for you to try to push it in um, Seattle. Oh, um, of course. And 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 what it is is, so so uh, a lot. We need examples who have gone. So I, one of the, one of the things I did as a, as a profession before I started with real estate was I worked in mental health, and mm -hmm. I became a peer support specialist. A peer support specialist is someone with learned experience in in um, whether it be substance abuse, mental health um you know what have you struggle um mm -hmm. going through something so that's what you need to qualify to be a peer support, peer support specialist because a person who is actually going through something who's going through the throes of life they don't want to hear 
how they can fix themselves from a person who's never been broken. You know, mm -hmm. so a peer support specialist is someone who's been broken, who is repaired, may, may still be in recovery, and they are reaching back to try to help people who are going through something. So that's one of the things I, I tried to implement in prisons because we have peer support specialists for individuals with mental health, but we don't have it for people come return from prison and people return. So I, I tried to get the program implemented in Greensboro. I mm -hmm. went through um, probation and parole because we, they have, we have a probation officer, but a probation officer is, is assigned to you to basically police you. you they're like mm -hmm. an extension of the prison system. They make mm -hmm. sure you don't mess up. They don't really help you um, and they don't guide you. A peer support specialist does just the opposite. A peer support, a peer support specialist will advise you, will listen to you to, and, and, try, to, and try to help you. Um, if you need a ride to the blood bank to get money to pay, they're going to take you. you know? So that's one of the things I do now. I, and I somehow became a speaker. I speak at prisons. I go yeah. into prisons. Like my first time going back into a prison was in South Carolina. And it blew my mind because I was voluntarily going into a prison. And, you know, like it was crazy, but you know, I, I, I was able to go back in. And one of the things that you cannot teach, you can't learn this in college. This is something that a person cannot learn if they haven't been through it. And that's how to adapt. Yeah. That's how to really, it comes from empathy. So my empathy came from a different point of somebody who hasn't ever gone through it. So when I went in there, I saw those brothers in, in, in orange and, you know, walking around in shower shoes and in, in their cells and, you know, the pride they took in their rooms and cleaning their cell. We were actually in the prison. We were in the prison. No prison guards. I was a part of a program. Um, what's the name of the program? Academy of Hope. Um, it's, it's a big program in South Carolina. So I, I kind of designed, designed my program. To, to for, with the same format in North Carolina and I'm trying to get into the prisons and I was in the process before COVID COVID kind of backed everything up yeah but, uh, yeah. my thing is because I know I, I influence individuals in prison and I know you know mind wise how our mindset is a lot different than people in society I know that I can reach individuals you know who are still in the what we call the belly of the beast who was mm -hmm. still um, incarcerated. So my, my thing as a re-entry advocate, I came home, I'm like, listen, I'm not gonna forget my brothers I left behind. So I came home immediately before I even got my feet under me good and I got my nonprofit started. And my nonprofit is geared towards prisons and youth. Um, so I don't, I don't wanna um, give up too much without some questions. You can, you, you know, you, I, I will go on for, for days. So you, might, <laughs> you, have to, you have to reel me in and redirect me where you want me. But when you talk about prison, that's something that I'm, I'm extremely passionate about. I would love to talk to you about um, um, a, a, the way we view it. Mm -hmm. So having come, come, coming from school, you view our, well, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say you, but people view our, our criminal justice system a certain way. Yeah. I have a very rare perspective on it because I've been in, in both the state and the federal level. I did mm -hmm. my 17 years in the federal prison system. So it's, there's a very, it's very different because each state is different, but the mm -hmm. federal system is throughout, throughout the country. And yeah. uh, I would love to um, enlighten people about, you know, what, what really happens in our system. Well, you, you can speak to that if you'd like right now. Um, I, so it's, it's, it's so much information. <laughs> about, uh, I don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, I try to keep it on on topic, right? What what what, what we got going on, and, and I have an opinion on everything because inside we have so much time to study and learn mm -hmm. and develop, and 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 people people in society think that guys come home with this prison uh, mentality. This oh, they didn't went in there and they don't learn a little. No, it's not that. It's just that we learn so much. We have so much time to focus on our studies. And there was a time where you could get degrees in college, I mean, in prison, but they, they kind of stopped that. Yeah. Um, because you had, you had people who felt like it wasn't fair that prisoners were getting degrees and you had people in society who couldn't, you know? So mm -hmm. 
they basically what the the youth called it hating. They hated on our situations in there, so they didn't want. It's all about um, bettering yourself, right? So exactly. If 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 education makes a person pre better prepared in society, then he's less likely to go out here and commit a crime. So by educating individuals in prison, you you make you're making society safer. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to look at things on the surface. I like to look at the root. What is the cause? My favorite, my favorite question is why. My favorite mark is a question mark. I question <laughs> everything. Um, one of the things I, I live by is believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. You know, mm -hmm. because that could be a lie. Um, it's just it's so I developed a different perspective in prison. I learned to look at things deeper. Um, not just on the surface. I'm not superficial. I try to look at things deep as possible and look at the overall root. So when I look at things like what's going on in our society right now um, with the, with the um, police killing our people, that's nothing new. It's just all of a sudden cameras are around, but we got to look at the root of it. Why? So no one is really, really. Um, so one of the causes, one of the reasons is population management, something that we don't discuss because our people are not knowledgeable of population management. And that's one of the things, it's like a rite of passage in prison that you read this one particular book and this one book will open your eyes and this book is called Behold a Pale Horse. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has walked through those doors has read that book, Behold a Pale Horse. And it, it basically wakes you up to what to government conspiracies and how deceptive our, our government can be. So when you read this book, you understand that these same people who were deceiving us, who, who've been killing us for years, by the way, um, they are still doing it. Yeah. And, 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 and the people who are, we call what we call woke. Uh, that's a new term. Oh yeah, he's woke. Yeah, that, so, so, all right, so these woke people, because they have, they have learned a few things, they feel like they're woke but you haven't met a woke person till you meet a, a, a guy in prison with a life sentence who's just been in there studying the whole time. So yeah. like me, like me, I read the, I read the dictionary like a novel. I read the dictionary like a novel. I read it like, when I say I have an extensive lexicon, I, I realized that I had an ability to remember things and, and my, um, what is it? My memory recall was, was, uh, cute. So I just started memorizing stuff. I started learning languages. I started just by my favorite game is Scrabble because of the words involved in it. So people in prison are not just sitting there wasting away. Not the majority. I would I would say not, there are guys in prison who are sitting there making themselves better. They're arming themselves. Um, so when they come out, they won't be in that situation again. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that that's been my passion. That's what's driven me to the point. I've been home now five years. And when I say I've made uh, huge accomplishments in my five years, and I'm not I'm not patting myself on the back because I'm nowhere near where I want to be. But yeah. I feel like I can help people in my position who were in my position get further than what they're getting, you know, and, and that's what's in my manual. I outlined 10 steps that I took to increase my chances of successfully transitioning. And I feel like if individuals would read my manual and take these steps, it will, it, it's not going, it's not a, a fix all. It's not a, a, a yeah. it's, it's just, a, it increases it. It increases mm -hmm. your chances. And I, I think everything is built around mathematics. So an increase is what I'm looking for. You mm -hmm. know, anything that decreases, beha behavior that decreases my chance, decreases my chances of staying in society, I, I, I run away from. Okay. Adosha, can, can, oh, I was going to say, can you, um, do you have your manual there? Can you drop, plug your, plug yourself? <laughs> I, I do. Oh, if it wasn't here. I do have, have my manual. I do have my manual, uh, but I haven't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know where I'm going to distribute it yet. I, I, I just published it. Um, so my goal, my goal is to get it in prisons. So I really want um, contracts with prisons, um, with education departments and pre-release departments. If they have them, some prisons have them. Most prisons in the United States, um, at some point people go home, you know, and when they go home, they have to go through, well, in the federal system, we go through what we call pre-release. Pre-release is supposed to prepare you 
for society. It's supposed to give you different, um, you know, uh, different organizations that work with prisoners, um, you know, help you with resume building, all these different things. So I want my manual in every pre-release department in the United States. That's, that's my goal. So I haven't really thought about um, selling it to individuals in society, although that, 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 that could happen. I could get them pretty easily. But um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's helpful for a person who may have a loved one in prison, mm -hmm. coming home from prison. If you like, I, I was given books by my ex. She would send me books that <laughs> really <laughs> that changed my, I'm married now. So while I was in there, you know, but um, it, they changed my view. They changed the way I, I looked at things. Um, I, and I do have a list of books that I put at the back that I feel like are, are just so impactful. And it's just what you read, what you read influences you in how you behave. Um, it, right. And the reason I was asking is because I've always worked with um, at-risk youth. Um, I've been a foster parent. Um, I was uh, in the juvenile system several times myself. My brother was incarcerated in CYA and served um, seven years from, uh, it, it's not juvenile hall and it's not prison. It's the in-between. I don't know what they call it um, out there, but he was in his 20s when he was released and he- CYA? Um, CYA, California Youth Authority is what okay, it was called. All right, all right. Um, and he was there for a while and even going through um, Orangewood Receiving Home, which was, um, a place I spent a lot of times as a foster kid myself, there was no manuals, you know, for people who, whether it's juvenile system or whether it's foster system, you kind of inherit this sense of institutionalization without any kind of um, foresight or anybody who's really given a damn about you, you know, to give you any um, direction. So that's why I was asking for um, your manual, because as we're looking at homeschooling our children as a major protest to what's being taught in the school systems and uh -huh. to keeping our kids off of the streets, you know, we can do pre-colonial work, but it's what you have in your hand, I feel, that's going to give our youth some insight to the BS that's out there and the actual game that they're going to have to play or even be aware that they're in a the game. You know, they're uh, when you're talking about increase, you know, the prison system and the juvenile system and the foster system is all private institutions. You know, they're just supported by, you know, the, um, the, the government systems to keep that pipeline going in. So I just see your insight and your peer, um, your peer to peer um, contact and connect that perspective is what's missing is that a lot of people won't take the courage to go back you know what I mean? And do any kind of counseling and going back in, you know, you saying that you're, you know, you went back to prison voluntarily, you know, I know exactly, you know, what you mean, because I've done, um, I went and got my nephew out of, out of a home, the same home that I was in. And I just, I couldn't believe it. That was um, eye opening for me just to be on that other side. So your services are definitely appreciated. Um, I don't want to take over the interview. I just wanted you to be able to drop your, get your plug in for that book and know that, you yeah. know, well, that I you appreciate it as well. Yes. I, I, I mean, if, if someone wanted the book, you could contact me easily. On, I'm on Facebook, or you could just email me at 072CAP at gmail.com. Um, okay. You know, yeah, yeah and, and, and they're um, relatively cheap. Um, $7.99 doesn't cost, well, for one, but if you were to buy 10 or more, the price drops. And, and my goal is to, to, to sell 10 or more. If I can sell them to um, programs like like different yes. programs, and that that's my goal ultimately. But yeah, um, so this was my way of trying to duplicate myself. My mm -hmm. mentor, um, I'm mentored by Mr. Um, Joel Dudley, of course, and he always told talks about being able to duplicate yourself, and that's how like because you can't be everywhere at once. But if yeah. you can figure out a way where you can be everywhere at once, and that was that was what the the manuals about was about. It was trying to duplicate myself because intention wise, I wish I could talk to every prison and maybe that will be possible, you know, through Zoom or whatever. I, I'm, I don't know how we can do it, but I definitely want to do it. I know I was impacted. Um, you will be surprised. I, I, I just, I had a, I had a feeling of, um, you know, what did I got to look forward to? I'm, I'm, I'm a felon. You know, so mm -hmm. when I, I watched the video and this is in my TEDx speech as well. And it was about a, a guy who came home and he got a job at a car dealership. And, you know, similar backgrounds. He was from Richmond, Virginia. 
So we were from the same state um, and he took off. He was on a commercial. He made money, money, you know? And when <laughs> I saw the video, like, yeah. So when I saw that video and this was in 2015, right before I came home, it was in the pre-release program I was in. And we were lucky, we were fortunate that the guy brought this video in. And I was in a program and this program is only taught at one place in the federal system. I was able to get in the program and that's where I saw the video. But mm. the rest of the people going home didn't get to see this video. But it yeah. changed me, man. When I saw that, like prior to that, I thought, okay, warehouse, maybe get my CDL. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't have high expectations because of your felony. But then when I realized that, okay, well, there are people doing things, you know, with a felony. That yeah. really changed me. That changed me. I came home ambitious. So that's how I became a real estate agent. Like, it was hard. But when someone told me, look, North Carolina allows you to become a realtor with your felony. It's hard, but it can be done. So the fact that it can be done means it's not impossible. It's possible. So I tried. I was successful. It took a long time. It took a lot. And, and a lot. And I think a lot of times um, these, these systems are set up to, to deter you and to, mm -hmm. to make you, you know, quit. Yeah. Um, I, I actually took the test for my insurance license. And like I say, I have a good memory. So I don't fail tests. And I passed <laughs> that one. You know, I don't. I don't. I love tests. So I, 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 um, I passed that as well. But they made it so much harder for me to get my life. Oh, well, we need a copy of all of your felonies, all of your, not felonies, all of your charges. And when I say I got a, a, a long, <laughs> she, like, I'm like in different states, in different states and different cities. And then it was like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I was like, well, look, I can't get this stuff. Yeah. These people, they've switched systems. They they can't find my, my papers and documents and I tried everything I could, and I was ultimately out of five hundred dollars that it took for the testing. But you know, it wasn't meant to be. I wasn't meant to sell insurance. I was meant to sell houses. So I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I don't regret anything I went through. That's what's up. Um, I think you're also talking about family support and how the prison system doesn't just affect, you know, the person who's incarcerated, but also affects, you know individuals who support that individual um what do you think could be better done to support you know a support system or what programs can also be implemented in that as well all right so my feelings on that are we are in a a capitalist society so the the you know the the powers that be are looking to capitalize off of us our situation um mm -hmm. our families our support they make it as hard as possible for us to be supported. For one, phone calls are, 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 are so high. It's just ridiculous. Um, when our families come to see us in visiting rooms, uh, something that will cost you 25 cents in society is going to cost you probably $2 in there, a snack. Like, you would be surprised. It's just the small things. It's the small mm -hmm. things that they do to make it harder for your loved ones to see you. Um, they, they have a test um, when you come in to visit in the federal system. I don't know about the state, but they have a wand that they rub on your clothing and mm -hmm. it picks up um, any marijuana, um, um, any sign of it. You, have, you can't come and visit, you know. So I've seen old grandmothers like turn around. Oh, smoke weed and man, look they make it as i don't know you can get residue from walking through a cloud i don't know where the exactly. residue comes from but they have they have made it so hard on our families like like for for, for our loved one like i didn't even want my family to come see me i was in texas for eight years and i didn't get a visit you know so i was all over the place my family was gonna fly i was like no don't come out here these 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 police are racist they're gonna treat you like they treat our families like they treat us like mm -hmm. honestly they like so it's it's that they, they just it's I didn't want my family being submitted to that. So it's it's bad. It's bad. And in some pla in some situations, they don't have um actual visits. You have to visit on a screen, um, like this. <laughs> this is your visit with your family. So uh yeah, it's it's I just I just feel like um ultimately I I, I could go I could go a little deeper on, on this whole 
prison situation, right? Like you talked about um, economically how prison um, affects us as a people and how how an F, I call it a felony an F. I call it F, like an F on your report card. Mm -hmm. So you like, oh, you got an F. So that's one of the things we, we that's part of our jargon. Like, man, I got an F, man, I can't apply here. You know, certain jobs won't allow yeah. you to apply if you got an F. Um, you know, so you got to find out, man, they hire felons. That's one of the things you do when you come home. You find out what jobs hire felons. So that's, yeah. that's crazy. And that's part, my talk, my TED talk. I, I had to keep going back to this because our discussion is on topic. Mm -hmm. you know, my talk that I will be giving tomorrow. And, and I talk about that in there, like the F. I talk about that in my manual. And, and one of the things I just show you just briefly, this is what I compare an F to. I don't know if you can see it, but it was um, when slaves ran away, right? Mm -hmm. And they became a problem. Mm -hmm. They would put that collar on them. Have you seen Harriet? They put mm -hmm. that collar yes. on them where they lock it on and they weld it. I mean, they, they actually weld it onto to, to where you can't take it off. That was called a slave collar. In, in some, some instances, it had a bail on it. So it was designed so a, a runaway slave couldn't run anymore because it'd get caught up in the bushes and the bells chime when they run and it'd make it easy for them to find them. It was called a slave, a, a slave collar. So that's what I compared a felony to. Mm -hmm. you know, that's my comparison uh, because that, that felony prevents you, it holds you back so much. And just like that slave collar was designed to hold back a potentially running a, a, a slave from potentially running away that f that f that felony holds us back from potentially launching like like taking off like the fact that i made a mistake in the past when i was 24 22 mm -hmm. 21 whatever the age shouldn't affect me when i'm 44 46 mm -hmm. 47 it, but it is that f follows you there's no there's no period when it's erased when it goes away like what i'm off paper i'm off probation but i still had an f i still can't go get a gun and register a, a, a firearm to protect my family you know i'm a homeowner i got i have a i have two little babies you know i have my wife to protect i have a house full of people mm -hmm. i can't protect them so i have a pit bull he's sitting right <laughs> here he's sitting right here this is my protection so yeah but but i shouldn't have to i shouldn't have to rely on a dog you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the things that, that is unfortunate. We can't get that F away. We can't get that F off. We got that call on them now. Ahmed, if you have any questions. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, um, uh, sorry for being late. My apologies on that. Um, I was going to say, so I have family um, that in the past um, served time, um, I think it was around like 13 years. And I remember when they came home, this is before I was born, but when they came home, um, like even to this day, like they still have like living restrictions, like where they can and can't go. Um, you know, like, and like you said, like, uh, I think registering a, a, for a firearm, um, you know, so what, so like, I was going to ask like, what ways have you found around, like, have you found any like ways around that or like any ways that can, you know, um, like what loopholes have you found for yourself? Like I know you mentioned your pit bull, um, but have you found any other things that are, you know, helpful? Hmm. Yeah, well, so so with the restrictions, you can't go to places like Australia, you can't go to Canada, you know, as a felon. Um, in, in the United States, I can go anywhere. Um, if, if you can't go somewhere, normally that means you have a sexual offense. So with, with anything mm -hmm. where you have a sex offense, you can't go around schools, you can't go around playgrounds. Yeah, that's that's different. So th that is a that's a whole nother monster. I don't I don't I don't, <laughs> I don't touch that. You know, I was a I was a drug dealer. I, I sold drugs and so so I I would I would say for my um fam uh, family member, they they're innocent. They uh, they okay. never accepted a plea or anything like that, but they yeah. Inevitably, we're given time. Um, oh, okay, got you. Yeah, yeah but I was yeah. saying like, but so so part of his part of his plea was probably that he had to register. So once he probably didn't realize it at the time, but once you register, man, it's it's down here because nobody wants to. It's like being a being a being a felon is like being at being um, 
I call it a second class citizen. So if mm -hmm. you are a, a felon and you are a sex offender, you're a third class citizen. Like they put them at the very bottom. So once you register, nobody will hire you. Um, no one wants to deal with you, talk to you. They, they feel like you are um, beyond help. Like that's, that's the way that they treat them, right? So you have, you have a high population of homeless throughout the United States. And quite a few of them are registered sex offenders. And the reason why they decide to be homeless is because if they don't have an address, they don't have to register. So they would rather live in a tent in the woods than, than live in a house mm -hmm. because a lot of people won't rent to them. Mm -hmm. If they do rent to them, they have to um, disclose it. Up. It has to be public. It has to be made public that there's a sex offender in this neighborhood. If you there's an app you can not an app a um, site you can go to, and it will tell you every sex offender within a five mile radius of your house. It costs you probably a dollar, five dollars to 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 join on that thing, and it'll tell you every sex. So that means everyone who is registered is on that thing, you know. So you know, and, and there's some people who might go on there just seeking for some, looking for somebody to do something to, do harm to. Because we, we, I'm not gonna say we, but there was a lot of harm done to them inside. So the, when they came inside, it was also made a way, they, everybody knew, oh, he's a, you know, a sex offender. So once that, come, once, once that type of person comes in, the only, I will tell you this, the only protection they have in prison is if they okay. take their sahada or if they become a Christian. That's the only protection they have either Muslim or Christian. Other than that, you're going to be victimized by everybody here. They're going to take your food. They're going to mm -hmm. raid your locker. They might beat you up at night. You know, like, so really most of them um, did one of the other. You know, that was one of, that was, that was, that was my experience in a federal prison. In federal prison that we call them chomos, it's short for child molesters. And everyone who has that label is not guilty. Everyone who has that le le uh, label does not have the same situation. Um, in some country, in some cities, in states, we have what we call the sweetheart law. If I'm a senior and my girlfriend is a freshman, when I turn 18, does that mean she's no longer my girlfriend? You know, we we in high school together. You feel what I'm saying? So it's not predatory. Um, it's just, and when I was in school, seniors were always going with the prettiest freshman, you know what I'm saying, or the prettiest temp grader. But when they turn 18, are they supposed to end their relationship with that person because they're two years older than them? So, so in certain certain states, they have what they call the sweetheart law, where you're allowed to maintain that relationship with that person because it started when you were of age. You know? mm -hmm. But in states like Louisiana and states where they don't have the sweetheart law, individuals are being charged and counted as self sex offenders because of that very same situation. So yeah, yeah. Every, for so. Everybody's story is situational. Um, in, in, in prison, they don't want to hear your story, you know, and it's, it's sad. They don't want to hear your story. You, 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 you a registered sex offender, give me everything out your locker. You know, <laughs> that's just how it is, unless you go get with a certain um, organizational group. And, and one thing, I, I, I shoot from the hip, I, I'm going to tell you everything straight. Um, I, was, I, was, I was in nine different institutions when I was in the federal system. I was a shot caller. So they have individuals who run um, the prison and they're called mm -hmm. shot, call shot callers. I was a shot caller for my race, not for my, I, first it was just my state. Um, Cause in federal prison, you go all over and you're from different states. So when you come in, if you're from North Carolina, you go with North Carolina car. If you're from uh, Washington, which Washington would roll, they went with California. You, you would go with their car and each car had a head, but then each ethnic, ethnic group had a head as well. So I was over my ethnic group. I was over all the blacks. So that meant um, each car, you know, had leaders. It's crazy because we have, we have our own system of um, organization. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 it's, 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 it's like a different world. It's a microcosm of what's, what's going on out here. It's just, and, and really if things were handled out in society, the way we handle them in there, it would be a whole lot smoother. You know, the systems would just, oh my, we had it. We didn't deal with police. We didn't have to go to the offices. We dealt with our problems ourselves, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, any more questions, you know? Because I, like I said, I can go forever. <laughs>
Um, you so your bio says that you grew up kind of in, in the crack era. Um, I um, I kind of want to get your opinion on like how, in comparison to that, to like the opioid crisis we have going on now and how that's being handled, and like the disparities in um, you know how folks who are quote unquote going through this um opioid crisis are getting more there's a lot more money getting thrown into treatment facilities and folks getting um help whereas with the crack pandemic it was kind of more like let's just lock everybody up um that kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that oh my god that is that is huge all right so let you, you did <laughs> i grew up in the crack era so i i i, I came up when crack hit I watched mm -hmm. crack when I was in elementary school when it first came out. We had a thing we look at called the weekly reader. And I remember when crack was the topic of the discussion when Nancy Reagan came out. That was my era. Say so no. With, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So yeah. with crack, um, with the this is your brain on drugs and all that, I came up in that. I watched it. I watched how it trickled down and how it affected my community and the communities around me. I watched people get addicted. And I watched people get incarcerated. So crack was the perfect tool, perfect tool for them to incarcerate um, our race. Why? Because so I, I will say this: it was it was designed. This this is a fact. It was designed and it was um, promoted in our communities because they wanted to remove us. Now every. Every, every, everything has a root. Like I say, everything has a root. What is the root of this? When I was in ninth grade or 10th or maybe 10th grade, we had to do a paper and I didn't know what I was going to do my paper on. And my teacher came to me and she said, well, why don't you do it on black genocide? Because she saw I was the pro black type. I was the, I wore the Africa, um, Pendulum. Medallion and yeah. you know, I, my book bag was covered with Africa, red, black, and green. Oh, Africa country. I'm still like that. Red, black, and green is what I wear. That's what I wear. My shoes, I got, that's me. Always been me. <laughs> oh, these are my shoes. Like, if I can buy, if my people make something, that's where I'm getting it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's always been my, even in high school. So she told me to do my paper on black genocide. Never heard of it once in my life. I did my paper on black genocide and it, and it changed my life. First of all, you won't find any other form of genocide in the encyclopedia. The only form of genocide they, they have in the encyclopedia was the was black genocide. And what was black genocide genocide by definition was the the plan in in the plan. Uh, I had like I say I have I have memory recall and it was the um ex extermination of the black race, you know, planned and manipulated extermination of the black race. So in order to have that in there, it it, it exists. This is something that exist. actually exists. You, you can go look up black genocide right now. And that's what it is. So why? Remember, that's my favorite question. Why do they want to exterminate the black race? Why us? You know, because we are the originators. So they want to take the original, what, what they call the dominant seed, because the European seed is recessive. The European yeah. seed is a seed that is a derivative. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is related to albinism you know albinos mm -hmm. so you know albinos we can make a white baby but a white baby a white person can't make a black baby but it's because of albinism and it and it's a uh what is it a, um genetic mutation it's exactly thank you very much so because of that and the fact that our our, our genes are dominant we are a threat to their recessive genes mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying so they had enough they had enough they had a study they had a big study and they came up with this thing called population management, which means they thought that, but at the rate of reproduction, that we would overpopulate the earth by the year 2040, uh, 2080. I forgot what the year was, but in order to slow that down and extend the, 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 the length of time we had on this earth, they had to eliminate and slow down our procreation. And they chose us. There was a meeting I forgot what a meeting was that, but it was of European nations. And we weren't invited because we were selected as the race that would be exterminated because of our ability to procreate, because of our dominant natures. Mm -hmm. So without us being told, we, we, were, we were um chosen for extermination. 
So what we see daily is that extermination plan being carried out in mm -hmm. different forms. Remember, in a war, you always fight on different fronts. You know, you're attacking from different, different uh, angles. That's how mm -hmm. you fight a battle. So what they're doing is they're attacking us in different ways. And we don't see it as an as a all-out attack on us, but they are attacking us in different ways through birth control, through yeah. Planned Parenthood. Uh, if you're not familiar with Planned Parenthood, please get familiar with it. Uh, what's her name? Nancy. Um, Nancy, the lady who founded Planned Parenthood. It was that's that was their most ingenious way of attacking us by giving us free free uh, free um, contraceptives. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the thing? They just put a thing in the in the girls called a North plant. It kept them from getting pregnant for like three years. They had something that stayed in and they for five years. And it was actually implanted in their skin. My girlfriend had one when I was young. Um, it was in her arms and you could feel it. Um, <laughs> it kept, kept her from getting pregnant for three years. So they don't want us having children. Mm -hmm. They have problems having children, you mm -hmm. know? So that, that's the difference. And we can have them easily. Like it's just, um, and, and Asians as well. So Asians, they implemented their own um, acts. And one of the things they did in China was they limited the amount of children they could have. You can only have one child. If you have a, if you have a set of twins, one of them going to stay with the government. The government is going to raise them. I forgot what the system was called. And most of them ended up being in the Olympics because they trained them. Uh, they trained them for athletics. The, 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 um, the extra, any kid you had over one. And I forgot what they called that, um, that sanction they had in China. I don't know if it's been lifted because they got over a billion people over there. I mean, over, um, What's the population of China? I forgot. It's way probably it's, over a billion. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Like, it's like over a billion, like one point something billion, you know. And 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 and, and planet wide, I won't say Africans. I was they, so so the classification is different. You know, you have Mongoloid, Negroid, Caucasoid, and Negroid meaning people of Black descent. Um, is right behind China, which is crazy because um, we were first on the planet and they surpassed us. For one, they live longer. Hmm. And they're, they're, hmm. they're, they're, they're parts of Asia where people live well over a hundred, you know, so that they live longer, yeah. they take a, a good care of themselves and they live simple lives with the majority of diet is, is, is fish, which is why I'm a pescatarian. It works for them. <laughs> it works for them. Must work for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, man, like 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 I say, I, because I was gone for so long and I studied so long, I I, I have um, I have so much stored in my mind that I learned and I memorized. And I never had a platform to release it. So this mm -hmm. is actually really the first time I've had a, a a a chance to really talk about these things. And um, believe it or not, there are people talking about it in prison all day, every day. We had ciphers on the yard where we would meet um, a group of enlightened individuals and we would talk about what's going on in the world and how we plan to change it and how we want to you know so the ancestors the elders are responsible for the youth and if the elders are locked away who's who's guiding the youth so we don't have enough guides out here I, I've, I've since I've since I've returned I want it to be an influence and a guide for you, not because I see that the, the, the determination on um, you guys' generation and even the generation just under you, but we don't have enough of my generation providing input. And, you know, it's, it's hard because the leaders have been chosen. And one of the things we, we do as a community is we choose weak leaders. Uh, weak leaders aren't, are not going to get you anywhere, even if you're strong. So I, it, there's a saying I forgot. Uh, um, it's it's better to have a lion followed by a sheep than have a sheep followed by lions. So your leader, who you choose to follow, is going to determine how far you get, not your your flock. You know, it's your leader because your leader, the energy of your leader, will filter down and trickle down to the people who follow him. So if we choose weak leaders, we are going to remain a weak people. You see what I'm saying? So we, and the, the, the strong leaders 
are the ones who are attacked, who are attacked and torn down because, you know, anybody from the outside doesn't want us to follow this person. Mm -hmm. He's wrong. But look, this is who you should follow. Look at Martin Luther King. You know, look what he did. He turned the blinds out. He, he turned the other cheek. He got spit on and got rocked. Well, I'm not that person. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's not my leader. That's, you know, that's, I, like, I appreciate you got streets named after him, but, but you got to look at why. Why? Remember, why? Ultimately, why did they do that? You know, why, why is it that he has a holiday and Marcus Garvey doesn't? You know, mm-hmm. so I look, I look at these things and I'm not religious. I'm not religious. I respect all religion, all religions, because I feel like religions are 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 a way of keeping man focused and, and and you know um what's the word I'm looking for um keep you from getting in trouble man like keep you disciplined you know what I'm saying so every everyone doesn't need it I don't think everyone needs it I think you know I can live a life that that most religious people would wish they could live without proclaiming anything. But the only thing is that we need to look past all of that when we're trying to do something collectively. Because if we allow those lines, if we allow those lines to continue to exist, we're going to continue to be divided. And we can't get anywhere divided. We need to be together. We need to be one. So my, my since I've come home, I've tried to tear down those lines. I try to tear down those lines. If we have a, 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 um, a, um, a march, It shouldn't be a march just led by a a Christian or a pastor who's going to call for prayer and everything is in the name of Jesus. That's offensive to you. You feel what I'm saying? So if, and it's the same as if it was a a, a Muslim and everything was in the name of, of Allah or Muhammad, you know, so I feel like to make everything all inclusive, we need to erase that. We need to save that for when we're with each other, when we're with our, 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 our families. But when we are trying to do something collectively, if it's supposed to be all inclusive, we, we need to respect each other, you know? Like I've been in a situation where someone grabbed my hand and said, brother, let's pray. I don't pray. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like what, what are you doing? You just gonna make me pray? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, and, and, and really it's gonna make it awkward for me. You know, yeah. like, hey, y'all can hold hands and pray. I ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm so, outside the circle. Yeah, so I, I want to allow somebody to put me in a box. You know, I respect everybody wherever they're at. Um, I, man, where you going? That's what I'm all about. Where you going? Where we going? I don't care who you are. If you going where I'm headed, we can go together. Mm-hmm. There's a saying, if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to go with other people because I want to go far. You know, that's that's the goal here for me. So earlier you brought up that um, your mentor is Joe Dudley. Can you can um, you talk about that experience a little bit and kind of how he's helped you kind of progress as well? Okay, so I was a part of a um, a body of individuals around here in in the Triad area, and we met weekly, and we talked about the plight of our people and what we could do to change it. Um, we didn't have the same views. Like, like I say, I, 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 have, I have different views. I look at things differently. I'm not passive. I won't take a <laughs> passive approach to anything. Um, so I felt like they were, you know, I, whatever. Anyway, I, I just didn't, I didn't fit in this community, but I didn't want to come in and change the community, although they were looking for strength. I just didn't think um, there was there. Was, anyway, somebody somebody told me, "Look, you need to go to this meeting that they have every week at Mr. Dudley House." And I'm like, "Who is Mr. Dudley? I'm from Virginia. I ain't never heard of Mr. Dudley." So it was like, "He's a millionaire. This, that, and the third. He has a, a mastermind meeting." So when they said mastermind, I feel like I'm a mastermind. So I need to be there. <laughs> well, well, how do I go there? And somebody told me, "Look." I'm gonna get you the number, you just go. So they text me, they gave me the um, directions to the place and said, just, just say that you're there um, to, to, to as such and such as guests. Now this person who I was a guest of, 
I've never met this individual. And mm. so I go to the meeting and it's at a mansion and it's a gated community and you got to put the code in to get in the gate. And I go out and I, I'm shocked. Like it's just a whole community of mansions. It's a mansion <laughs> neighborhood. So when I go there, it's, it's, it, it just, it blew my mind. I've never been a part of that. You know, I grew up in the projects. Um, I'm from the hood hood, you know what I'm saying? So when I went there, that, I've never been in a house that big in my life, you know? And then we went in the basement and we had a meeting and we were talking about money and how to make money. And I realized making money can help me, with mm. my people, help me do what mm -hmm. I want to do for my people. The more I have, the more I can give. But I just learned so much from this man, you know? Like, and like I say, they were Christians. But that wasn't a thing for me. They didn't close in prayer. They didn't make they didn't put make it uncomfortable for me. So I sat there for three meetings. They didn't know who I was. You know, but hey brother, how you doing? Like they knew who I was. And I told them that a brother named Lance I was his guest. He didn't even come. So I was <laughs> I was there. I didn't know anybody, but they embraced me. They took me in. And when I finally gave them my story, gave them my spiel, it was a rap. They loved me. Um, I've been there ever since. Um, I'm like a part of the family now. So when I say he's my mentor, I have multiple uh, mentors. He's my hands-on mentor. Let me put it like that. Because I feel like if I'm not a follower. So um, I won't let one person's um, direction be my direction. But if I like certain things you're doing, then I will adapt and I will, you know, but how he did things and how I do things is different. Mm -hmm. His his advice is still sage to me, you mm -hmm. know, because he was a door to door salesman. He 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 did it differently. Me, I I'm I'm trying to go the way of multiple streams of income. He doesn't believe in that. He believes in focusing wow. on one thing. Interesting. Oh, no, Mr. Mr. Dudley, he has a saying. Um um, what is it? I forgot the saying, but he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he wants you to be focused on one thing. So look, I'm going to get this advice from you, Mr. Dudley, but I ain't, this, I'm going to leave that for other people, but this is the way I'm going to go, you know? So yeah, you have to be, you have to be um, true to yourself, regardless of who you select or who you choose to be your mentor. Um, yeah, it's, it's certain people um, that I respect greatly. I respect their their um, certain things about them, but there might be something about them that I I ain't with that party, you know. But you know, I feel like as as a as a people, we get into blind following, like just like I'm with anything he with. Nah, I ain't with everything he with. If he say something that I feel like ain't right, I'm not with it. I'm with <laughs> that, you know. But nah, nah, he going off to the left now, you know. So yeah, we have to be man enough. We have to be brave enough to acknowledge when. When someone is is saying something that you're not a part of, you don't have to accept. And, and that's a key word I said, brave. So you know we have to learn to be more courageous, and 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 you know be true to yourself. But yeah, that that's that's my mentor, and he he's he's um, mentioned in my speech as well. And and when I say mentor, it's it's strictly um, you know for intellectual intellectual benefit it's not like uh, he doesn't do anything monetarily for me you know i've never <laughs> i've never to ask him for any money just I, and i don't even necessarily have to be a millionaire i want to be in a position to help people but mr dudley wants mm -hmm. to make people millionaires so hey that's what it's going to take i'll be a millionaire <laughs> you know uh, but but i'm i'm happy with what i have a thousandaire i'm good with that but you know i, I want to help people that's, <laughs> that's the ultimate goal I think that, yeah, what you said was important. Like, um, uh, one thing that stuck with me was really like the idea of being open-minded. Like I admire that about you, about how open-minded you are. Like, you know, I may agree with what he says about this, but you know, I might not, uh, agree with that. And I think that's a thing that's like not common in, especially the youth. They're very like, you know, pick sides type of, yeah, you, know, yes. you real like, yeah, you rooted here, especially like, you know, in the like different places like the South with their Bible belts, it's like mm -hmm. Christian, you know, we do it this way. All right, you know. And then if you like go to, you know, East Coast and like New York, it's like it's like, oh, you might be either Christian or Muslim. So it's like, you know, like people like like just like the especially in the West Coast is real diverse. So it's like, you know, like depending on where you go, you like uh you got different people like that. But yeah. um 
but yeah, like one thing I have Malcolm X here. Um, okay. Yeah. And my grandmother. That's one of the autobiography. I read that. Yeah. I don't know where my yeah. copy is. It's somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, we always keep it uh, right here. But anyways, uh, but yeah, my grandmother. Um, she said, like, when she was coming up, uh, and she would hear all this stuff about the, uh, the Nation of Islam, like, a lot of, she didn't agree, her grandmother was um, white Irish, so she didn't agree with the whole uh, aspect of them thinking they were the devil or anything like that, because she said her grandmother was, like, one of the sweetest uh, people. Uh, okay, yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah. Her grandmother was one of the sweetest people she knew. Yeah. So she said, but she I admired the aspects of them, like, cleaning up you know, especially like the neighborhoods and things like that, getting them straight and all that. Um, so I think, and then she always taught me, uh, like the mind is like a parachute, it only works when it's open. Like okay. you have to really be um, open-minded. So I, I would definitely say like, uh, as a youth, like I do admire that about you, about being open-minded and being confident in that, so. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I um, so, so I, I, your, who, who did you say that, that said that, um, my grandmother. Yeah. So your grandmother hit, that's, that's, that's something that kind of, um, pushed, pushed a lot of people away from the um, teachings of, of, uh, Master Far Muhammad, who taught Elijah Muhammad, who taught Malcolm X, um, who taught, um, Allah, um, or Clarence 13 X. Um, but me, Man, my my, I, like like you said, um, there are certain elements that I like about that whole movement, and it was the fact that so, I have I have a um philo my philosophy about that, it was needed, it mm -hmm. was needed. Those things. So in order to change the way we viewed ourselves, they had to re, they had to make you envision yourself. They had to give you a different. Uh, a vision of black men of blackness mm -hmm. because we were coming from a time when we what the the what was that the Jim Crow laws we couldn't even walk on the sidewalk mm -hmm. with white people if they were walking towards you on the sidewalk you had to lower your gaze and get off the sidewalk you can't look them in the eye you know what I'm saying so that was what we were coming from so in order to change that it had to be a a a, a like so this painting I have, I did a painting um, of Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Noble Drew Ali, um, Harriet Tubman, uh, uh, Asada Shakur, uh, 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 Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Obama. I did that for Black History. I did it for um, uh, some something. I'm an artist as well. I didn't even talk about that. So I'm an <laughs> artist. I'm, <laughs> I'm an artist as well, right? So uh yeah, so so I my 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 um activism comes out in my art mm -hmm. a lot of times. If you were to see paintings I have in my garage, I painted the Panthers. You know, these are people who who I, I love I'm a throwback of the Black Panthers. As I, that's that's how I refer. If I were alive in that time, I would have been a Panther. So mm -hmm. that's that's the person I am today. Um I love the Panthers. You know, it's like I, I love the Panthers. There ain't no if fans or bus about it. I love the Panthers um, because of the love they had for us. Like they did what they did for us. So, and, and, it, and, it, and it's crazy how um, we allow society to, to de demonize our heroes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're scared. We're scared to say that we respect someone because of how they view them. Like one of my greatest idols, other than Harriet Tubman is Nat Turner. And mm -hmm. Nat Turner was demonized in school when you heard about Nat Turner because they supposedly went through and slaughtered um, all these white family white people. Yeah. How many of us did they, did y'all yeah. been slaughtered? You know what I'm so so, so that's, that's, you done went and slaughtered whole villages. They killed off a whole people, the Tasmanians in Australia, the whole race. You killed the whole race of people because you wanted their resources. You wanted Tasmania, you know. So, but but you talk about Nat Turner because he killed a few white families because he was being oppressed. So it's the way they 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 switch it over and make it like we're the the enemy, you know. Mm -hmm. Like Malcolm X was the enemy because he wanted to fight against his oppressor. Yeah. The the, the um the the Black Panthers are the enemy. Come on, they're the enemy. Armed resistance. Not armed attack. 
we were about armed resistance. Mm -hmm. Like we're not gonna let you just keep killing us. So mm -hmm. when we when someone gets to that point, all of a sudden he's demonized in 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 the eye in the press. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it it scares our elders. Our elders get scared. They get oh no, you ain't supposed to behave like so you man, we could we could talk about this forever. I got I, I could go into other other elements, but you know, I'm not I'm going I'm not I'm I'm, I'm gonna not get off my uh, I'm gonna get off my soapbox for now, um, because, like I say, I, this is something that I am very passionate about. Um, it's overdue. Um, yeah, and 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 I, I I I'm really grateful to be speaking to people on the West Coast. Um, I because I have so much respect for the Panthers and the resistance that came from that coast. Um, so yeah, I I I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Adasha here doing a time check. It is five o'clock. I appreciate you coming on and speaking with us. Uh, blessing us with some knowledge um, and insight. Um, good luck on your TED talk tomorrow. Hopefully this just warmed you up. I can't wait to, to hear it and link it together and said, we got you first. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will and, let you know when it airs. It's, it will air in September on, on YouTube. Okay. Okay. We'll do that. And um, hopefully when you come out to Seattle, um, you can look us up. Uh, well, hopefully we'll all, inshallah, we'll all be here. Um, all right. But, um, and maybe this will be the first of many. You know, there's yeah. a lot of things that you speak of that we just don't know about here on the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things, the reasons why we wanted to do an unapologetically Black and Muslim um, channel is because a lot, you had mentors, you had people looking out for you where my family, it was kind of, we didn't go Malcolm, we went, you know, we, uh, we didn't, yeah, we didn't go Malcolm, we went Martin. And so in order for us to switch back or even get that knowledge and that feel, you know, we're having to dig deep. And so in the South, it, it was different, you know, so hearing that stories and hearing that there was a, a Joe Dudley, I honestly didn't know, you know, <laughs> who, who that was uh, yeah. until he's come up, you know, quite often. So just having, you know, stories from the South and being able to connect has been awesome. And I wanted to bring you to the, the youth here that are, um, I mean, they're passionate about it and they, they wanted to know more. When I met you, it was like, you guys just had to connect. Well, I appreciate it. I'm here. Whenever you want to talk to me, I'm here. <laughs> it's already a yes, like I said. You ain't even gotta ask me. We just scheduled. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate it, and um, yeah, like I say, just give me a call and help me get these in the West Coast. All right. Oh, no, I'm definitely. <laughs> yes. No, definitely. And I was thinking, not just you know, um, like re-entry programs but even like our mosques you know like we have a lot of folks who a lot of of guys who convert on the inside and once they come outside yeah, yeah, come to the yeah. outside you know the first place that they want to go to is the mosque and mm -hmm. um i feel like that's also a, a place that could be a hub for um even if the, your um uh, 10 point plan is there that's like the only resource that they can pick up from there if that's the only help that they can they can get that would be a very beneficial well I, yeah i i know it will help them i know <laughs> it i know <laughs> yeah i know that was it. one thing my brother said is he wanted to write a book and he and unfortunately he didn't get a chance to make that happen so to see that you know you got out and you were able to live your dreams and um take that kind of painting off of you and redirect you know redirect your life and your goals yeah. you know what i mean and, and don't have that f you know, predict to you what you are able to do. You've been able to uh, supersede and surpass that. You know what I mean? And you're guiding others to do that. So that's just, you know, yeah. like we say, may Allah increase you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Salam alaikum. Uh, Thank you, Salam. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. She's still on here. I don't know if she's still on here. She might have left. But that was good. Yeah. Um, All right. Um, dang, I feel how long were you guys talking? Oh, not long before you hopped on. Okay. You probably yeah, have like an hour.